Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Welcome to the American Foreign Service Association, or AFSA. My name is Ian Houston. I'm the executive director, and it's a real pleasure to have you here. Uh, we extend a warm welcome to all of you and also to our C-SPAN audience uh, and visitors watching this uh, broadcast live and also likely uh, uh, taped uh, on the C-SPAN website. Uh, we will also, AFSA will be uh, putting a link on our website to the broadcast at a later time. Uh, you can visit the program at AFSA, A-F-S-A dot O-R-G. AFSA is approaching 16,000 dues-paying members. Uh, the organization represents over 28,000 active and retired Foreign Service employees um, of the Department of State. United States Agency for International De Development, as well as the Foreign Agricultural Service, the Foreign Commercial Service, and the International Broadcasting Bureau. Our, our Foreign Service is a patriotic group of talented professionals making a difference for the United States and the American people every day. And we honor them with this particular discussion. Again, for more about APSA and our programs, you may visit our website at APSA.org. APSA book notes programs uh, and similar activities that we do, public outreach events, are sponsored by APSA's Fund for American Diplomacy, which is our charitable or educational entity. Uh, we appreciate the support that those in this room perhaps are providing and also our listeners and viewers. Uh, if you have any questions about how to support the Fund for American Diplomacy, feel free to send me an email at Houston at AFSA.org. Uh, finally, it's my pleasure to introduce the presiding officer and president of AFSA, Susan Johnson. Uh, Susan is a 31-year uh, career diplomat, and I appreciate being able uh, to turn the podium over to her, uh, such an experienced and talented diplomat. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much, Ian, and many thanks to all of you, and a warm welcome to AFSA this morning. Um, at, Ian has told you uh, quite a bit about AFSA, but I'd just like to say it's a particular pleasure to me to welcome someone like Ambassador Hull, who sort of in, in my, uh, from my perspective represents uh, the master practitioner of diplomacy who's now moved into academia, who's putting forth books like this, and who uh, is part of that um, great national asset I think we have in our diplomats generally and our retired diplomats uh, very much included. So I'd like to uh, echo Ian's uh, warm welcome and a welcome to you, Ambassador Hull. This morning we are going to be treated to a discussion on a very important topic, the emerging Middle East uh, uh, and Yemen as one of its many, unfortunately, hot spots and in the context of the presence of Al-Qaeda there. So given the news and given development over the last several months, uh, the program could hardly be timelier. Um, and that also applies, I guess, to the publication of Ambassador Hull's book. Now, I have not had a chance to read it myself. I very much look forward to doing so. But from th those who have, who tell, tell me it's a great read. So I'm sure we'll all feel that more so after this morning's discussion. Our guide through this discussion is a very distinguished retired diplomat, Ambassador Edmund Hull, and his new book, High Value Target, Countering Al-Qaeda in Yemen, will be sort of the basic roadmap for the discussion this morning. Ambassador Hull served as ambassador to Yemen from 2001 to 2004 and has extensive experience working on counterterrorism issues at the State Department. Uh, those of you who are at this uh, event this morning will have seen a more extensive bio uh, uh, details and data in the announcements. So his extensive credentials, both in terms of the Middle East, a fluent Arabic speaker, and in terms of counterterrorism, speak for themselves. So without further ado, I'm going to turn the podium over to Ambassador Hull. Uh, and he will be speaking for, I don't know, 20 minutes or so, and then there'll be plenty of time for question or answer. Thank you very much. Ambassador Holt.
Testing, one, two. Okay, that's the hard part. Uh, I want to thank Susan Johnson for that gracious introduction and AFSA uh, for hosting this event today. And I want to thank all of you for, for coming here. I know that uh, for most people in state, uh, there's not a lot of spare time. Uh, and some of you are taking uh, time away from important work. I hope I can make it worthwhile. Um, what I'd like to do is to um, really make three propositions uh, and then turn to your questions and answers and talk about what you are interested in. Uh, the first proposition uh, is that the State Department is not, by and large, a learning institution. The State Department has many, many strengths. It recruits some of the best and the brightest generally. It takes care of them uh, and it challenges them. However, unlike the military, uh, in my experience, there is little systematic attention to lessons learned. And unlike US business, again, in my experience, there's little or no emphasis on best practices. Rather, the State Department tends to recruit very smart individuals, provides them a modicum of training, and asks them to improvise solutions. And a lot depends in the Foreign Service on who you work for. If you work for someone like Henry Kissinger, you're likely to get good lessons in geopolitical strategy and how to develop real options. If you work for somebody like Jim Baker, you're likely to uh, learn a lot about deal making, uh, as he did in getting us all to the Madrid conference. If you work for somebody like Bill Burns, you're likely to get um, lessons in creative humility and the significance of an initiative like the Middle East Partnership Initiative. And fortunately for state, we have so many exemplary individuals, and we have such a small workforce that it does fairly well with these personal examples, but not, I suggest, anywhere near optimal. Uh, as Susan was suggesting, uh, I think we should be more deliberate in tap tapping best practices uh, so that even if you're not so fortunate as to work with one of these people, uh, you can derive lessons from such practitioners. It's helpful, for example, to see how George Kennan analyzes the sources of Soviet conduct, or to um, learn how someone like Dick Holbrook strives to end a war, or how Colin Powell leads. Wouldn't it be great to have a book from Ryan Crocker on expeditionary diplomacy, or a book from Pat Kennedy on management and diplomacy, or a book someday from Mark Grossman on AFPAC diplomacy. So I believe this is for state an area for improvement. And I assume that this is what the Academy of Diplomatic Studies and Training has in mind with this series on, on diplomats and diplomacy. And it's an ambition for my particular book, High Value Target. Now the second proposition I'd like to make to you this morning is that effective counterterrorism needs a strategy. I argue in this book uh, that counterterrorism should not be conceived narrowly as an intelligence matter or a military question but rather it should be conceived as a broad strategy. In